there's two things I want to say before we get stuck in. Um, there's two things that really surprised me in an excited way, which makes this this conversation a bit more special uh, for me personally. One is you hear this phrase a lot about people being a motivational speaker and a personal coach, almost to the point where anyone says it. And not to say that n not everyone can be it, but I think it it's very easily thrown around without a lot of basis. But what I really loved about, even though we've only really interacted once before this, it was quite immediate to see how that fits in with you and everything that you've done since then. It comes, and I don't want to obviously spoil the story too much, but it comes from a place where you have something to offer to an audience based on a very, very personal experience. And it, it puts this this whole level of, you know, what you do in terms of motivate and coach. And really, that's that's a thanks for me to you, that it gives me a bit more faith in the world of motivational speakers and coaches. And I mean, you may know yourself, people who claim to be it and either doing it for the wrong reasons um, or end up doing it for the wrong reasons, even though they start with maybe a, a genuine take on what they want to do. No, thank you so much. That's, that's actually such a lovely thing for you to say. I often say to people that I took a certification just to prove that I can do this, but really life experience is what creates that intelligence, creates that knowing how it feels. And that's why I do what I do, because I don't want anyone to feel the way I did. I want to be able to help people pull themselves off the ground when they're knocked down the way I was. And if I can do it, I really want everyone to believe they can do it. There's no reason why they can't. And I sincerely do care. I really, really do. So thank you. And I noticed that, and that, that goes on to the second point of even the circumstances in which we met. Um, your message is to the core of how I interpret it, quite simple, about escaping fear and going towards a place of love. And again, these are words that are very easily said. Um, and then again, maybe this is more skeptical side of me, that... Um, and you see it all over social media, it's very easy to put a inspirational quote behind not much meaning in, in a picture or whatever. Yeah. But even from that first interaction, and I can vouch for the people who were there at the time, it was so engaging, which is why I really wanted to get you uh, on an episode because, I mean, the listeners will soon find out, but I think it's your way of saying what it really means to escape fear what it really means to understand the influence of why certain things have happened and how you're then able to extract from people who may either convince themselves that they are in an okay place or that things can't get any better so things are good enough. It's almost like finding a secret. Yeah. I found this amazing secret called love and people think, oh, it's a bit wishy-washy, but I talk about love day in, day out. And then you find the secret and you want to tell everybody else about it and I literally want to pull you in and the people around the corner, and anybody, it doesn't matter who it is, it doesn't matter what shape, form they are, I literally want everyone to understand this little secret, because I know it will change their lives, it will set them free, it really does, so ultimately as humans, we all want to be loved, mm. I know I am full to the brim of love, so why not share it, why not give that as well, because I know almost how it feels not to be loved, um, and that's one of the reasons I keep pushing and pushing and pushing, so that there's no more no more hatred, no more fear. And I do believe that love works on a, a totally different frequency and that it's one of the most powerfulest of weapons, I will call it. In yeah. The world. And I, I am weaponizing love to that point. No, I like that. And so let's let's go back to really what the basis of this show is beyond your own life. So before the time when you were born and to try and understand Firstly, the story of where your heritage or ancestry stemmed from to how it arrived to today. Do you know much about, say, the background of, yeah, you know, your heritage and culture and how it ended up migrating to um, to the UK and, and why essentially you were here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love my parents. I want to say that on the opposite. I wouldn't be sat here if I didn't, you know, if it wasn't for them. And I'll always respect them and I'll always love them. So there's never any disregard. I'm not beating up my culture. I actually love my culture. 
I love taking the bits from it I want <laughs> and leaving the judgmental side and the bits I don't want and, and leave it to those people who want to use it. It's fine. It's what they know. But, you know, over in the 60s, my parents came over because they wanted a better life for themselves. And I think there was this huge rush. It's like people being told, go over to the UK and make a better life for yourselves. I remember my mum saying, I didn't come on a boat. I came on a plane. Mm. I'm really proud of that. And they were coming however they could get here. And they were coming over to start a new life, to make a better life for their children, to make a better life for them and their families. And my father actually went to Singapore first, and then he came over to the UK. Um, so he had his own battles, I think, too, because he'd gone to Singapore as quite a young person. And he, I, I know little bits and bobs because there was no interaction between us. But from what I've learned, he was washing dishes, um, mm. you know, for a while in a restaurant. But there were seven of them. My father's one of seven brothers. So they were all together, which was nice. But they were obviously doing these mundane tasks yeah. to then come to the UK. And you know what? It takes a lot to change where you're living, to leave the land, of motherland, as I call it, and to set up base somewhere else. You know, most people won't move from the areas that they live in now. They find it quite... Um, you know, they don't want to do that because it's, it takes effort yeah. and it's easier to stay where you are and have the friends you've always had. But it requires it requires to be brave and it's a huge step into growth in a personal space. So I completely respect them and I know why they came over and it was literally to create that better life for themselves. And so were they from Punjab? So my parents are from North India, Punjab. Yeah. My father and his brothers all lived on a huge, huge farm I have been back when I was little. Um, and, you know, it was open space. The house was quite a big house compared to the other uh, houses in the village and maybe to accommodate them all. <laughs> but, you know, they had a huge farm, as I said, and they were regarded as wealthy because mm. they are the farmers. and That's their caste, although I don't believe in castes and they're not really supposed to, but they still do, and that that's what they did. The, yeah, the reason... That's so fascinating. Is so my background is um yeah Hindu Indian, yeah. uh quite a broad, set like quite a broad sentiment just to say uh you know from India and I'm Hindu but my parents were actually born in East Africa so my connection and the influence on my life from what was going on in India around that time is probably less so than you know people who have um. Uh, from a Punjabi background, do have parents who who were born there, but you know, e ever since the Indian independence, uh, and you know, I would love to hear your thoughts or your take on this. But there was so much violence, and on this show, I've had people from uh, like a Bengali background, where <clears throat> their parents grew up around the huge levels of torture, massacre, and violence that were happening in Bengal. That were you know nothing really to do with the people from there, but it was a huge divide that was occurring between the Muslims and the Hindus yeah. um, and it seems very much so that uh, the Sikhs and you know people who were Punjab whether they were identifying as Muslim or as Hindu they faced what probably is the largest forced migration and you know massacre of, I think up to a million people at the time do you see that as have, have, having had any influence either on your parents or you know people within your society that they've carried either this fear of violence or anger because of it no most definitely see i i have a different kind of perspective to most as you know i saw india and i see india as one hmm. the world is one um and we were living in peace we were all hindus effectively we were living in the way that we knew we were practicing our religion however it may be done and then suddenly we have this influx of the Mughal Empire that had come in. Yeah. They were taking the girls. I understand they were taking all the girls mainly from the north too because it was on the borderline. And then we had this huge thing where um, there was segregation between Pakistan and India. And Punjab means five. There were five rivers. Yeah. Only they were left with two. And there was a real almost um, vengeance against Muslims and Sikhs and there's this ongoing thing where you must hate a Muslim mm. if you're wanting to marry a Muslim you know they're at the bottom of the list there's this list that goes you can marry somebody who's Punjabi in your caste if not the caste then a slightly lower one okay we might accept it if it's a different caste and then it goes on to Hindu onto a white British person then it goes on to 
blacks and Muslims are sort of on the same sort of verge. I never really got it. Yeah. To me, we're all one. And as a child, I remember getting thrown out of Sunday school saying, but I'm not white, so that means I'm black in society. And I was like, you don't ever come back here again. Okay, so with this brown South Asian thing that people keep talking about, again, I don't really fit in there either yeah. because I'm a woman. So all women are one to me. If we're talking about women, let's talk about one one thing. But there is a segregation. There's a segregation between castes. Even though in Sikhi, in my religion, in Sikh religion, it says there are no castes. Yeah, yeah. That we have four entrances to the temple. Anybody is welcome. Any colour, any creed, any sex. We don't have that detachment, but, but they do carry it forward. Um, especially with the Muslim society. And now people fight one another, but they don't really know why. Mm -hmm. And that's not just in India. You know, I go to Ireland a lot and I understand the Catholics and the Protestants. And I've spoken to people there. And they still have this mm, sort of attitude. But really, I believe my parents and my grandma possibly was a gypsy. I've been told this too. So what does that make me? You know, it's this whole sense of wanting to belong to something, wanting to belong to a community. And, you know, through life, I've understood that you don't belong to anyone. You belong to yourself. It's you know, And as people, we should all just accommodate one another, respect one another, because you can't say all Sikhs are great. You can't say all oh, Hindus are great. You can't say all oh, white British Catholics or Christians are great. Everyone has to be judged and looked upon as their individual self. So it's a really sad, sad existence that cultures are still programming their children. And those children are then programming their children to understand that it's wrong to dislike somebody of a certain culture because this Muslims of today are not on horseback taking Sikh girls. Yeah. You know, the, the, the things that are happening in Telford, the things that are happening up north, with the grooming, I understand that. But then it's also the clients are often white British people that are not shown. So it takes a lot of different people to come together to create even those sort of untoward things that are created um, whereby young girls are taken advantage of. But we are highlighting the people of colour that are creating that first initial aspect of taking the girls and grooming them. So what I'm trying to say is that, again, we are one. You shouldn't dislike anybody and give them a chance. What your parents are telling you is what their parents told them and they didn't know any better. But guess what you do? You get to choose that now. Uh, yeah, I love, I love how you finished on that point because going back to what you said about, you know, from uh, Siki, it's, it's about this acceptance and i think when you look historically um you know and guru nanak and when it when the sikh religion all started it was all about this idea of one this you know this concept of there is this one god and it doesn't it's not just defined by one but um it, it all ultimately rolls up into this one so whichever you believe in it's accepted and they were quite strongly of the belief of equality between genders but you also, I've heard you talk about how even when people migrate, they they take a lot of their cultural restrictions with them. But with the, you know, coming from a Sikh background, which was so pro-equality, uh, where did, you know, I guess, where did those cracks in that happen? Where in, you know, in, in a number of cases and something that you uh, are so strongly um, made raising awareness of is the things like the honor killings which I'm sure we'll get into it still exists and not just in one specific area and one specific geography it's all over because these cultural restrictions go on why do you think that's happened well I, I always I do describe that my parents packed very tightly in their suitcases when they come over and I, I want to sort of create that imagery when people are packing to leave their homes what do they take with them and they did bring their beliefs because that, again, that's their understanding of how life should be. Mm. But you know what? People that are in India are actually a lot more modern than the people that have moved out of India because they've learned to move on. Whereas, again, it's the identity. This is our identity. And all of this honour that, that they talk about, the honour that I talk about, the honour-based killings, it's always about what everybody else thinks, never about what they're actually thinking themselves. I mean, my example, my father's example, you know, he had his separate life. So when you come into living into the UK or America or, or in another country, wherever it may be, you adapt to the way they live, but they haven't done that. They've lived in their sex 
the little sections of you know Hindus would live together around the same area so they can access one another to help one another out. It's a community. I understand that community. So they're very away from being influenced or letting their children be influenced by the Western culture. It was always regarded as bad. Mm. And yet, if you got a job in a bank, I don't know why, <laughs> as a girl, it was good. Um, but that was a Western thing to do. Obviously, you've got the engineer, the doctor, and the you know the whole thing. But um, they they really brought everything with them because that, for them, was almost like their set of rules, which has got nothing to do with religion. But the problem we have is a lot of these religious establishments, be they um, whatever religious, because I've read nearly every book there is, um, religious book, the religi- religious places are not being really taught from the scripts. They're being taught from a cultural point of view because the people that are in place are living by those cultural beliefs. So you'll have the, the Gyanni at the Godwara, for instance, who will be, girls should cover their this, they should do this, they should do that, and segregation, men sit there, women sit there. As you said, in the Sikhi um, Guru Granth Sahib, it says that we are all one. And that's why the new religion, it's a new religion, it was almost to bring people together, but a lot of people, if you ask them what it actually means, or if they know any of the scripts, will say, of course we do, of course we do, is an arrogance, but they don't. And I have read the Quran, and that's a beautiful text, I tell you. I read the Quran because I wanted to understand somebody else's point of view. I'm like that. But I'd read it as a child as well. I've read the Old Testament, the New Testament, the, the Gita I've read. And they all tell you, really, how to live as a good person. Yeah. But who who really follows that? <laughs> it's yeah, it's fascinating. And I think th- this is something that I really wanted to ask you, and it's based on something that I read. So I'm just gonna get your opinion. So yeah, it's this this idea that in large extended families, especially that there's the individual is subordinate to the collective. So a certain individual is more value uh, and actually certain individual individuals are more valuable than others so a young man given that they you know their strength they can go to battle to defend something that probably did apply in an era where you had to be a warrior in in a sort uh would be more value than a woman who's more frail or weaker traditionally speaking and then on the other side even young girls are more valuable than older women so there's clearly a you know, treating the human as an asset, but ultimately because it feeds into this collective. And, you know, the importance of family and community is important, but to the point at which it's valuing that collective in all that it means over the individual, where if the individual does something to go against that collective, even if it's perfectly right for that individual, it's regarded as wrong and something that could, you know, regard it like due a punishment. That... So that idea, or let me rephrase it, you know, that version of almost an insensitivity to a individual human's life, why do you think that's been almost allowed to carry on as a mindset or teaching through so many centuries or through so many generations? Yeah, I see it as a a disease, I'll be honest with you, because people are told what to do. You know, as a child, we don't know what we're doing anyway, so we're programmed, we're told, this is right, this is wrong. But then even when you get to an age where you're wanting to decide yourself, you're not really allowed from cultures such as mine. You're being guided, but guided to a point where there's always a guilt complex on there. So when a child from a culture like ours and one similar will say, actually, you know what, I'm not really feeling, oh, why are you not feeling it? I've done everything for you that I never had for myself. You know, you get these things thrown at you constantly so that you actually start to believe what your parents are telling you. And normally in these larger families, it's not just your parents, your uncle, your aunts, your grandparents. And, you know, you'll say, you'll get told that your granddad will have a heart attack because of you, that your mother is going to die because of you. And I have to say to some people, do you really think that you have that control to make a person die? Yes, you might cause them stress. Yes, you might cause them concern. But do you really think that you are able to do that? And it's a very um, narcissistic attitude that carries on. And it's quite poisonous to the point where men will often get married because they are forced into it as well. They don't necessarily want to, but to keep face, to keep their parents happy. And then they become aggressive because 
again, they're living a life they don't want to be living. So their ag aggression is a way of them expressing, releasing. They can't say it to their parents because they're still scared of their parents. And what will their parents say to them? Man up and do this and do this. So the woman, unfortunately, will get that domestic violence um, imposed upon her. She'll get it from her, her mother-in-law. She'll get it from her father-in-law because for some reason there's always that jealousy concept. It's very strange to understand. They're never really accepting of that person they have chosen for their own son. And there's this huge amount of toxic behaviour under one roof. And you imagine the frequency then in that home to bring up a child. That child is going to do whatever they're surrounded by. It's going to continue and continue and continue. And then they get to university and they're like, oh, wow, what do we do with this freedom? Right, we're going to go crazy. And they go out every night. They do what they want. They have girlfriends, boyfriends, like a normal teenager. But then they have to be forced to go back into this house. And I'm using the house as an imagery of a box. They go back into the box and they become what's expected of them. And it's really difficult. It's actually soul-destroying and mentally disruptive to that child but they will succumb to the pressures. And I've got people that have come and stood next to me and said to me, very few words, but I know exactly what they're thinking and what they want to tell me without speaking because they'll be coaxed into this marriage that they feel they should be getting. And you know what? As a parent, you want your child to be happy, but it's not about you. Parents in our culture make it about them. What would people say? How will I look? Are you never going to have children? Are you going to be too old to have children? By your age, I had three children. You know, so you're constantly carrying this guilt around. You can't get the right job. It's constantly trying to please people. People pleasing is something in our cultures that's very, very common in men and women. The women, as you said, are regarded as the weaker sex. And they regard themselves as the weaker sex. because They're told that. They do tread on eggshells because they're constantly scared of upsetting somebody or saying the wrong thing because they know they're not really allowed to. So it's it's not a really nice home to be brought up in but it's not like that in every home but it isn't it's like that in most homes this this box and this restriction in the upbringing that you talk about did you directly experience that in your upbringing so mine was um quite extreme but it was extreme back then now it's more relaxed but it still happens so yeah so i had a very extreme um, box. It was my four bare walls of my room, um, and I was literally called out to modern day slavery, domestic chores. Um, but I didn't see it as that until mm. I got involved with the trafficking side. And a lady who runs one of the trafficking organisations that I work with actually sat me down and said that when you were a child, it's regarded as modern day slavery. Nina, you have to see that child brides are regarded as child brides because you're under a certain age. Um, so yeah, a lot of things I didn't realise until recently. What was, what what was what was she referring to in terms of? She was referring to that my fondest memory of childhood is receiving this blue box that I always describe. It was a crate. We used to get crates in those days, you know, and you have bottles in them. But it was an empty crate that my father had brought back, and um, I was able to turn that upside down. And the first day I saw it, I nearly wet myself. I was so happy. I was trying not to let anyone see I was smiling because I wasn't really supposed to show expression. But it just meant I was super fast. I could reach everything. And I was standing on this crate cooking. And I felt like, you know, I was just a super person. I was a superhero. And I was making the chapatis really quick so I could reach everything. Was I would tippy-toe. I would literally tippy-toe as a six-year-old child trying to flip them over and not drop them because they would often fall. And I'd obviously be told off. So I think that day I probably shaved off about 20 minutes, which my parents were happy about because they got their food quicker, my brother's. And it just meant washing up was easier. I wasn't drenched every time. <laughs> yeah. And your your experience growing up. So one thing that I really like to touch on yeah. um, in this idea of, of living in this third culture, it's normally where your home environment or the one of your ancestry is different to the one in the society around you. Were you given the chance to expose yourself to the differences in you know, the culture and the tra traditions of the environment of the people around you and society in school versus what you were experiencing at home? So I was brought up in um, a part of Leicester that 
my my father moved to originally we all lived in Birmingham um he lived in Birmingham with all of his brothers around but for some reason he decided to move to Leicester and he moved to Leicester um just before I was born and then I was born then we moved back apparently and then we moved back again and I went to a school where I was the only person of colour and my brother was the other person of colour so every playtime it would either be fight 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 he was getting beat up or fight 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 I was getting beat up so it wasn't really an escape but school is something I loved because it had a library Mm. and I loved to read and I would stand in the library for hours just looking at the books often touching them because books for me became my friends they became my toys and I would take them home and sleep on them sometimes because I didn't have a pillow so school was um, an experience of a different kind and would you did you regard it as an escape or because you know uh, there are some people who regard school as their place of learning you know they're really they're really intrigued in their younger years to learn about things others regard it as their place to socialize because they have their friends what did it mean for you yeah for me it meant the best part of school was walking to school and walking back that was my adventure because i'd made a friend who was um a white british girl and she would teach me songs from top of the pops back then i didn't know any music she would teach me the dances i remember her having smarties one day and i was mystified and sort of really excited about all these colorful sweets i didn't want to eat them i just wanted to look at them but she wet them and she was pretending they were lipstick. All these little things of make-believe. And we would hide and climb in trees and things. And I'd be curious at the time because I knew I had to get back. But they were the best parts of my childhood. Those little memories that she created. And she taught me that people can be kind. That was one of the most important things in my childhood, I think. It's good you had that exposure. Did you? Were you ever allowed to go to the house or have friends over? No, um, she asked me for tea, which was the thing back then. Can you come for tea? Um, but I wasn't allowed. And one day um, she came back with me, but I didn't tell my mum she was coming back, which caused a real problem because my mum wanted to know, asking me in Indian, you know, why is she here? And um, I said very little because I, I, I wasn't allowed to speak, really. And my mum made her a cup of tea with some bourbon biscuits. And she looked really confused because she thought she was coming for tea, as in, dinner yeah yeah but she got a cup of tea and some bourbons and, and was sent on away she literally lived around the corner but the next day then she told everybody at school that she went to my house and she didn't get fed and you know I kind of lost that friendship for a little while until a couple of years later where she started to befriend me again because we were in the same sex and I think she understood herself that there was something going on that wasn't right in my life what did you mean when you said that you weren't really allowed to speak so I, um, all the communication in my house was non-verbal. So my mother would literally tell you where to go by pointing. And um, she still does that now, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know if she does that. But she, um, because I was a girl, I wasn't really supposed to speak. I was supposed to keep my eyes down, not look, make contact with my brothers, not touching. So I would literally scurry around and I had that habit of really crouching forward and trying to be like a little mouse. Um they would shout out odd words like food, clean, and that would be it, and go. So you really did you really notice the the difference between how the genders, how the, a son and a daughter were treated in your household? I did, but I didn't question it because that's all I knew. So if I knew that's the way, why would I say, why am I not be treating that way? Nowadays, a girl knows that a little bit more because she's exposed to more than I was. I wasn't allowed to watch television And I've described it that I would literally push my ear against the wall of my dorm, actually push it against my door so that I could hear the television. And I would, I've always been away with the fairies. So I would sit there and pretend I was sitting on the sofa with my brothers watching the films of Kung Fu. You know, I could always hear them at the end of a Kung Fu film fighting and I'd be like pretending as well. But um, I didn't feel lonely because I didn't know any different. Wow. And what was the real turning point in your childhood? Yeah, the turning point, I learned things were wrong when I got to 14 and I was attacked by um, my father and his friends that's when I just knew that it wasn't right it was that whole feeling something's very wrong with my life and what without having to recall what was 
what was very significant in that moment and how did you respond to it? Yeah, so I, um, you know, it was quite a standard thing that my dad would go to the pub, come back with lots of his friends. It was a, always a Saturday thing, you know, he'd go to the pub, they'd close, bring them back for chicken and rice and obviously it's a standard thing. Um, and I was actually quite excited because I knew most of them from a young age, you know, called them all uncles, not that they're related, but you just called them that out of respect. But one particular night I'd got up quite groggy, I'd turned 14, I was very hormonal, turning into a young woman and I'd come down and, you know, our bodies have this way of telling us something's not right and we always ignore it. So you were you were sleeping when they came? Yeah, I always used to be asleep and my mother would wake me up, she'd open the door for them. We often had a key on a string and they used to pull it through the letterbox and open it and then push it back in. Um, sometimes my mum would open it, otherwise you could hear them come in and I'd wake up knowing that he wants to be fed with his friends. And my job was always to wait until they'd finished because my father didn't like mess and you probably know that from our culture. They like to keep the guest room very tidy and clean. And um, as, as I was waiting that day, I, I just felt very wrong. And my dog, for some reason, would always be at the top of the stairs. But that night she was at the bottom of the stairs and I felt she also instinctively knew that she needed to protect me. And when I went to collect the dishes at the end of their food, I was literally thrown onto the table by my father first and raped continuously for several hours by him and his friends until I passed out and when I did wake up I remember stroking my matted hair because my hair was full of blood as well and telling myself Nina you're going to be all right but I knew I wasn't and that's when I knew things were not okay. And did you how did how did you respond to that did you leave did you stay i am um, if anyone had said to me at school do you need help or a stranger a neighbor anyone had asked me i would have said i need help but no one ever did and um, my teacher should have noticed because i went from the people please student sitting at the front hand up first to just not caring if they were beating me up, I didn't care. You know, at school, if there was a fight, I just didn't care. People were spitting in my hair, which they often did, I didn't care. Um, so nobody really picked up, or if they did, they thought somebody else would deal with it, which is part of the problem with society. But that did lead to a pregnancy, which led to an abortion, which led to me trying to take my life. And I understand mental health, living in a culture of that sort now, it's so overwhelming um, because my parents had said, who will want me? And I really thought, well, who will? Because their words carried so much weight and that weight had got me, it just got me really down. You know, that, that weight was that I was carrying was theirs that they had imposed upon me. So it was like this huge rock on my back that I was just carrying day in, day out. And I felt dirty and I felt disgusted with myself. Even though I know now it wasn't me that had imposed that hurt upon me, I was a child. But but I felt I felt I was just worthless. What was your home environment like after that first incident? The you know, the relationship with your parents or even your brothers? My father acted like nothing happened. My brothers, I'm sure they knew acted like nothing happened, and my mother was very vindictive. You know, it went from being poked with a finger to being poked with scissors. Um, so she was very angry with me and I thought it was me that had created this problem realistically it was you know maybe I'd looked the wrong way maybe I'd made eye contact you know you question yourself as a child you do um, so life became unbearable because in my own mind I wasn't that happy child that would come running down the stairs to cook for them and clean for them because that was my extension of love mm. That was the way I interacted with them. That was the way I was part of a family. And suddenly I was just putting one foot in front of the other when we've all been there. You know, one foot in front of the other just to get by through the day. And so, th yeah, this is this is where it's, you know, it really touches on a nerve. And I'm sure the people listening <clears throat> will have a ton of questions. And for me, it's, you know... It's, it's it's easy, very easy to talk now to you and see, you know, how open your eyes are and how much you're helping others. But it's very diff difficult to 
go back and be put in your shoes back then unless you yourself but did you or you know looking back now the idea that um you know your the human life or your human life wasn't regarded as you know a life should was it something that you could empathize why they were acting in that way well i would say that people only act in the way they know so i can't even try to figure out why they did it i don't need to nobody needs to they act in the way they think is right um a drunken moment or whatever it may be doesn't mean it's okay because it's definitely not i'm not condoning that I'm just saying that we'll never know what somebody ever really feels or thinks. What I feel as a mother myself is that I should have been protected by the very hands that were supposed to raise me, to look after me, to love me. They were the same hands that held me down and abused me. And incest is huge in our culture and culture similar to it because girls will not speak out. And since I have done, my Instagram's flooded all the time with girls saying that it happened to them or they were sexually touched inappropriately by brothers, cousins, uncles, mummy, mummy being the mum's brother. It's a very common thing. And they have gone to their mothers and said, this has happened. And the mother has said, shh, don't say anything. So where do you go to? Who do you speak to within our culture? If you're being told to be quiet, you don't have anyone to talk to. And I know there are organisations like the Seek Me Too movement, but I'm not completely convinced that they will with uphold somebody um, in the way they should be because everyone's afraid of everyone in our culture. Mm. And I'm not. So I speak out. And I say that with complete 100% confidence that I'm different in that sense that as much love as I have for everyone, I will not allow somebody to be hurt and I will hold people accountable. I can't force anyone to speak up about it, but at least I can say to them, look, this is wrong. You've done nothing wrong because you have not forced that person to touch you inappropriately. And um, there is this huge stigma of shame and bestie and is a... But if we take that away from the perpetrators by speaking out openly, and the word rape is op openly used, sexual abuse is openly used that person's going to know I can't say any I can't do anything because you'll say something they talk about it so easy now we can't do it anymore and they will stop I believe that but whilst this stigma is created for the girls or men or boys that are involved then it'll carry on and where did you go next after these events and well after that I um my father was very worried and they were talking about sending me away i remember that i didn't care you know at that point i was just do whatever you want i've had enough of this life um but one of the perpetrators came forward he was a sikh person with a turban um he was one of the people that raped me continuously after many had left he stayed <clears throat> and um he said he had a solution my excuse me sorry my father came down my father came and called me down from my room and said um go into the front room i went into the guest room and there sat my father my mother the gentleman well the chap that had raped me and his wife and i thought i don't know what's happening i'm 15 what's going on and they put a chunni on my head money was put into my lap my photos i've got a few that i've found are really disturbing I look really worried. I look really unhappy. I look really scared. And I went upstairs and I threw up a few times because I was told I was going to get married. I didn't know if I was marrying him. I didn't know who I was marrying. It didn't make sense to me. But I was marrying his son because his son had an English girlfriend. So to save face, there was this amazing solution. And my dad kept saying, everyone's happy now. Everyone's happy. And I thought, what does happiness mean? I didn't know. And so you had to, essentially, you were forced to marry and live with this. So, yeah, so at the age of 15, I was promised. Um, I believe my dad traded me, if I'm being honest. 
He gave him lots of gold, lots of money. They were demanding washing machines because in those days no one had them. My father was saying, yes, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. I could hear it. And um, a price, I reckon, was put on my head. And I was going to be married into this family, not for the son. When I did get there, I had a little cupboard almost made for me. It was very small, had a tiny bed, a makeshift bed. It was like a camp bed and a wardrobe. I remember the wardrobe because I was constantly, I had this obsession of folding my clothes because it kept me busy. But I was a servant. That's why I'd gone there as a servant to cook and clean for them, but also to be sexually abused whilst I was there by my father-in-law. Wow. Knowledge to the family. And they all slept upstairs. And he would come down in the night or even in the day and he would just take advantage of me. And did you, did yeah, how how did that relationship develop? I mean, it developed in the sense of I would say no. And I, as the older I got, they were very greedy for money. My my parents were quite um, wealthy. My father had created a lot of wealth. Um, they asked me to go and work, which was their mistake, because I started at a very large organisation where there were nobody really working of colour. I managed to get myself a position as a manager because they needed more money. So I was like, well, I'm going to go and get the best job, trying to people please. But that was an escape. I would walk in and say hi to everyone. You know, I was a totally different person. And I would go home back into my shell wearing really old Indian clothes because that's what I was allowed. I had an eating disorder by now because my food was being really restricted. My father never really let me eat. And then I'd gone into this marital home where my mother-in-law was very vindictive and would throw any food I made for myself into the bin with the plate. And I'd either have to eat it from the bin or I would have to just not eat. And I decided not to eat. Um, yeah, so that led to me getting really fed up because my father-in-law would tie my ankles with metal coat hangers. Um, and it was done to prove a point that he was in control. So he would leave me naked with metal coat hangers around my ankles and they would dig into me and I, I would need the toilet. I would just have to be on the floor and clean it up after when they got back. But it was really a control tactic to say that you have to be here to instill that fear. And I wouldn't even cry from the fear of them seeing that I'd cried. You know, I would hold those tears deep within. Um, and it was a really, really hard time for me because I was turning 19. I'd been there for, already for a couple of years and I I just found life very difficult. At which point did you say this was enough? You know, we're always influenced by somebody saying one thing. And as a coach, I can say something that may make a difference. But I've often said you could be on a bus and somebody could say something and it'll just click. And that's literally what happened. I had two people at work. They were a couple. Um, he was from Africa and she was Punjabi. And she would say to me, you know what? Why are your ankles bleeding? Why have you got punched? You've been punched. I know, no, no, I haven't. You know, and, and they worked it out. It didn't take a lot to work out what was going on in my life. Um, also, they were in a second job because I worked in my day job. But then I found a job selling kitchens on the mobile, you know, phones in those days. And I loved it. I used to love ringing people saying, oh, we've got somebody in your area. <laughs> um, I did really well at it. Um, but they were they were my friends as I saw them. And she said, look, if anything happens, come to our house. But you know what? Go back to your mum and dad's because this is crazy. You know, my mum and dad would never let me go through this. And things have changed. You're now 21. And 21 sounded really old. Mm. You know, and I hadn't had a baby. Girls were being burnt alive in the areas, brides. It was called the burning brides of the 1990s where they were being set alight. The mother-in-laws or people would often pour f um, petrol on them and set them alight and say they'd committed suicide. And the police, the police were ill-equipped. They just didn't want to know. I think that's enough, enough reason for someone to leave. And I got to work one day and I thought, I'm not going back to my in-laws. I'm going home. And I painted this picture in my head of being pulled in, being held, being loved. So I went, I went to my parents. And did that, is that how it panned out? 
Not really, no. Um, they'd found out I was on my way because in our community, somebody always sees you. We didn't need mobile phones back then, just the word of mouth. So I, I thought I was going to surprise them. I thought I was, you know, on the on the bus working out, what am I going to say? But before I got there, they knew because some auntie had seen me getting on the wrong bus and let them know that, you know, she's on her way. So um, that led to um, attempted honour killing. And as I describe it in my TED talk, um, it was a savage attack whereby... Both my brother, one of my brothers, and my father beat me. And I play it down, actually, if I'm being honest, because I was literally bouncing off the walls, but I never say that. I was quite a frail thing. And they're, you know, they're two big guys. My brother's over six foot, my father's an ex-professional wrestler. He's wrestling, um, and he was he's quite a well-known wrestler, so... So yeah, so they broke my arm and my jaw, and then when I did fall down, they stamped on me. But they broke me. They didn't necessarily break the bones. And I do feel I died that day, as strange as that sounds, because I remember looking in and thinking, are you going to make it through? This very gruesome day, which, you know, you can still recall so vividly, but it, you know... Time heals some wounds, but this I can see firstly, you know, it still affects you and rightfully so. But, you know, what I love about you is that you've managed to channel this into what you're doing for other people, right? You haven't tried to completely block that out and ignore it and try and move on. And, you know, this has happened to me. It's horrible, but I don't want to think about it again, right? You've really managed to channel it. But, you know, reliving that. Now, of course, what happened. And the way you speak about, you know, almost being at that point of death where some may not have survived it. What do you think? What do you think really fueled it? Do you think it was this detest or this anger that you'd betrayed them directly? Or did it really come from a place of shame that, you know, what you've done is a disrespect to the name of the family in terms of the perception to the wider community, or do you think it was something completely different? <clears throat> yeah, so um, it was actually stopped. The honour killing was stopped by my other brother, two brothers, and he said, not here, and they stopped. I think their anger had almost died down a little bit um, because they were furious. They were furious, and when I say the insults were heavy, the insults were things like, you know, how can we go out again? You will want to marry the other brother because one of my eldest brother wasn't married. Nobody's going to marry him now. Um, your father, you know, he's going to have a heart attack. My father was the one beating me. Um, so really, it was a case of it was all about what people were going to say and the family to start with, and that extended to the community. Um, <clears throat> they have a phrase where they say "chutney bug," which means white turban. It's a figurative speech because my father didn't wear a turban. Actually, he ran lots of pubs, so he wasn't religious at all. But it was a saying that I had tainted that turban um, because having a girl is not really desired. And then to have a girl like me, as they kept saying, had created all of these problems. And um, I felt rubbish. I felt I should die. I felt I shouldn't live. I felt they were doing the right thing. And I remember looking up at my mother at one point and she had her arms crossed. And my sister-in-law was there too with her arms crossed. They were angry. So angry that I felt that I was wrong. I shouldn't have left. I should have stayed there. So it was a real puzzling time for me in the sense of I didn't know what to do. And I do believe I died. You know, on that same carpet I had been raped as a child. I, I literally had lay in my blood twice on that carpet. And when I say lay in my blood, the carpet was sodden with my blood. The first time it was sodden with my blood from a different nature because of the rape. But the second time, there was not one part of my body that wasn't cut or bruised or, you know, there was blood seeming from my scalp everywhere. It was just quite horrific. I looked like something out of a horror film. Um, and I was left there for three days just to think. Nobody came in. No one came to check on me. Well, I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't even move. Everything hurt to a point where 
and it was just too much to, to bear. Something that I've heard you talk about in your TED talk, which I will um, put in the description for people to hear more about the story. Um, and, you know, there's some of the other stuff which I can't wait to get onto. But one thing you say which really stood out was honor and killing are two words that shouldn't be allowed yeah, to be paired together. Honor and killing. There is no, none. And, you know, I do get upset. Uh, I'm, I'm human. So to know that that happened to me at 14, because I look at a 14 year old now, they may be going through it. It breaks my heart. You know, I, I'm, I'm acknowledging my pain. Yes, time does heal it, but it still hurts. And it hurts that they did that to me. And it hurts that they're doing it to other people. And to be honourable means you are respecting that person and loving. And there is none of that I see in the community or the culture. I don't see it. The whole is it thing is so over emphasized about izzat izzat which means honor honor um and that's a word we grow up with but what what is honor to them their understanding of honor is very different whereas to me there's just one way of and also i think it's called an honor killing because it carries a different weight when it comes to the legal system too an honor killing is looked at differently as opposed to a murder or an attempted murder I don't think they used it for that reason, but I think that there shouldn't be a word on a killing. I think it should just be regarded as an attempt to murder. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating how for for people who, again, you know, I keep coming back to it, but regard the human life or the human life probably as the highest thing above, um, you know, whether it's community, whether it's this thing called honor. But something that I found quite interesting and. I really want to get your take on it. So it, it talks about where honor killings occur. Um, again, I'll put a, a link to where I found this, but it says that it occurs amongst Christian minorities in Arab countries, as well as among the Sikh community in India and their respective immigrant countries in the West. So th this is predominantly where it happens, and you are obviously subject to that. It says they appear to be non-existent in a lot of Muslim-dominated countries. But the main thing is that it's not ever seen in tribal tradition or, you know, the religious teachings or even in the law. However, the promotion of, you know, lawfulness of husbands, physical violence against wives and, you know, criminalizing, you know, the premarital or extramarital sexual relationship. So te like treating it as a crime and then allowing punishment in the form of violence. Has this been indirectly misinterpreted as honor killings or do you think it's it's something that is being taught by you know these these sort of tribal traditions or is it this mis bit that this gross misinterpretation that um these you know these sects are allowed to get away with yeah i think um i mean honor killings happen even in venezuela i was talking to somebody the other day south america and um, it's very common there. You know, I spoke at an event and she came afterwards and said to me, it's really, it's really bewildering that you're speaking about this because my cousin was killed because of an honour killing. And it's how women are looked at, um, that they carry the pride of their parents, that they carry the respect of their parents. So if they choose to go and have a boyfriend or if they go into a job that is looked upon as not so respectful, then they bring shame upon the family. It 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 happens in Pakistan the most, apparently. Um, but I believe that it happens all around the world, and we don't know about it. Mm. I didn't report my honor killing attempt. I didn't. I went into hospital for months. Nobody asked me why I was there. We're not supposed to speak about it. There is a stigma. And who's going to report a child missing if it's the parents that have killed and buried the daughter or son themselves. How would you know? When daughters were being born in my times, they were placed into plastic bags and suffocated and buried. And I know this for a fact, which is why I know and I'm grateful every day that I was allowed to live, regardless of what happened, I'm here. So a lot of these statistics I don't believe in because, again, like domestic violence, like a lot of things, things do not get reported. You can't report them. 
you can't speak out. So who's going to know and who's going to help you? Mm -hmm. And this is where I think it's really important, everything that you have been working on over the last few years and are still working on. And I, I really want you to, to get significant time to talk about um, everything that you're raising your awareness out and putting all of your efforts into, you know, day in and day out. And one thing that I want to mention is something that I read about you in an article where it said that you have this unique or as I'd like to call it gifted ability to see right through people even when they try their best to painstakingly conceal their emotions. And, you know, even to a point where people may have even convinced themselves that things are okay or at least good enough, you have a way to connect with them in a way that doesn't make them feel more victimized. But, you know, like we spoke at the beginning of the episode, because it comes from a genuine place that you're not just throwing around these words like fear and love. It's something that you genuinely do um embody in what you're saying and i think people will get that now that you've had a chance to speak more about it do you think this is something that you always had in you or do you think it's these extreme circumstances and experience that you went through that's made you more attuned to it um right so so who am i now you know i am nina Ork, i always say and I'm this activist. I speak out against honour killings and human trafficking because it means so much to me. And I want to help them. You know, I want to help them find the place that I'm at right now. And it was somebody called Leon McKenzie, who's played football for England and also is a boxer as well, who said to me, you must have trained yourself as a child to somehow let go of things because I've never met anyone like you. He said, but you always have this very gentle, maternal, giving side. And I understand that. I do believe I'm a mother to all. I always say this. I'm very maternal. And I want everyone to have fun. And, you know, there's a fun side to me. But I've been knocked down, just like most people listening have been knocked down, in, in a concept. And pain is pain. If there's no comparison or she's had a worse life. Because if you're going through something tough, it feels like it's the worst thing for you. And I respect that. So I'm not never comparing. But what I'm saying is that a loss is a loss. Pain is pain. If I can do it, you can do it. But tell me what I can do to make it better. Because I wish somebody had said that to me. And if I can do that for somebody, that's true wealth. You know, I was a millionaire before I came homeless six, seven years ago. I had a lot of money. I could buy any car I wanted. I could go on any holiday I wanted. I was going through a lot of domestic violence, but I didn't understand it then. But actually, I feel wealthier now because of this love that I have for me, this love that I can give to you, to the next person, but also this knowledge, this whole understanding of how we should be of service to others, not because it's something we should do, but because it's really the only way to live, the only way to actually live. And I I genuinely care about everyone. I will stop and speak to everybody just because it matters. And everything that's happened to me in my life isn't a trauma. It was a way of me learning. It was a teaching, you know, as I see it. The whole aspect of the rape, yes, it hurts, but could I have understood a girl or a woman or a boy or a man that's been through that or going through that or wanting to speak out about that had I not been there? No, I couldn't. Could I have been that person to help somebody being bullied at school if I hadn't been bullied myself? No, because books don't teach you this. Could I have been that person to reach out to somebody who's homeless and say, I know what you really need and it's not that cup of coffee, is it? You just want to be seen. And I spent a whole lifetime of wanting to be seen. And I never was. But I didn't see myself. And I said to somebody recently, they said, Nina, if you could do anything in the world, what would it be? And I said, I'd write love letters. I'd write a love letter to everybody saying, this is how I see you because you are an amazing person. And when they read that love letter, I want it to be almost like they're manifesting this love for themselves so they can see how great they are and how beautiful and wonderful they are and how handsome and how able they are to give to others. And that for me would be great. It would be magnificent. And as I said, wealth isn't measured in a monetary form. It isn't. It's measured in knowing that you're 
making a change and I'm determined to make that change and I always have somebody to protect me when I go to places like today because of an ambush I have to be understanding and I have to be mature enough to know that I'm not invincible I also know that regardless of the death threats I get on LinkedIn Instagram and all across social media that I don't think they would kill me because they'd make me a martyr and then my message would be quickly interpreted you know it would become huge I know that so while I keep saying end on a killing stop trafficking stop abuse stop domestic violence stop pushing your sons to do things they don't want to do stop forcing this upon children child brides the whole nine yards that I talk about mental health in young men which I talk about those messages will become a lot bigger if I am killed however I'm careful so I do have security that I go wherever I go because I'm at risk Mm -hmm. but you're at risk because you say something that's of value and they know that and the fear that they instilled in me I don't have anymore I feel that I'm wearing this suit of armoire you know suit of love Mm -hmm. like a bodysuit that protects me but then I'm also understanding that maybe it won't um but I really do hope that the snowball that I'm pushing to the top of this mountain by the time I get it there that it will come down with such a velocity that it will start making a change in people's lives, if not in my lifetime, then lifetimes in the future, because it's not egotistical. This is something I want for people for a totally different reason. I don't want everyone to know Nina did it. It doesn't make a difference. And if I have a 100 Ninas standing next to me, that just means the message will get there quicker. More people will be loved. So if I could have an army of love, we would literally take over the world and Get rid of all of that fear. Get rid of all of that hate. And say to people of my own community that I care and love to say to them, listen, children are gifts. They are gifts. Whether they're a boy or a girl, they are gifts. Let's just give them a lot of love. We bring children into this world to love and to teach them to love themselves, but they're not living for us. Let's allow them to make mistakes. It's part of learning. Let's allow them to find their own way. And they will. We can't always teach them everything, but we can be there when they need us. And I say that to my children. I say that I will always let you do what you're going to do, but you know where I am. And they don't always ask me things. I don't always get it right. But they do know that whatever happens, that I'm going to support them if they decide they don't want to study, if they don't want to do whatever they're doing. It's okay. And my younger son hasn't studied. He didn't go to you. He'd got into all of the top universities, the finance, you know, Imperial, all of them. I um, can't remember the other one, but really great universities. Everyone was like, what are you going to do? You need to try and get him to study. And I said, no, it doesn't matter. My other son failed his year at medical school. And normally in an Indian household, nobody would say anything. And I said, well, you failed. Good. What are you going to do about it now? And it taught him so much. That lesson of failing taught him to appreciate, to value to also work out his own methodology of sitting in the exams. So now he can go to somebody else that's failed. And he, somebody reached out to him and said, I failed too. And he said, you know what? It's the best year of your life. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. And this is what I learned. And to be able to gift somebody else that. So life, part of life is falling down and getting up. And I've been knocked down that many times. I know how to get up. Mm. So if I can reach out a hand and say to somebody... I can help you get up, but really what I want to do is give you the tools to be able to get up yourself and know that, you know, you have support, which is huge. You know, families should support one another. Communities should support one another, not tear each other apart. Who who do these, you know, where are these coming from? Is it from um, people, you know, close to you, personal people, or is it from the societies and communities where, you know, you're standing up against what they believe in? A lot of the death threats are from the Middle East on LinkedIn. I get occasional marriage, you know, proposals Mm. that makes me chuckle. But a lot of them are from the Middle East and my family. You know, I I, I still get the messages, nobody will believe you. You're lying to sell books. My book has nothing to do with honour killings. Um, And, you know, there is a worry sometimes that who will believe me? But then I know that I'm coming from my heart. What have I got to lie about? Why would anybody lie about these things? And I know that it's going to make a difference, and it is. And every time I get a message from somebody, somebody said, I literally went on Clubhouse for two seconds yesterday, and somebody sent me a message saying, you know, 
when you said the part about, I said that when I was homeless, I created this puddle of tears. And I said that it's within your weakest times you find your strengths, whereas we're always taught, don't cry, be strong, mm. cry, be strong. And I did break down when I was homeless with my youngest son. And it was in that time I created this puddle of tears. And I said, am I going to dance in these tears or am I going to drown in them? And the lady remembered what I'd said and sent me a message and said that it gave us such strength and it gave her the reason to keep going. And you've got to find your keep going. You know, what is your keep going? Are you doing it for your children? Are you doing it for your friends? Are you doing it for your parents? But really, you should be doing it for you. Because I've only just discovered me and I love every part of me. And that's not egotistical or arrogant or any, you know, there's, I'm not perfect, but I love the fact I'm not perfect. And if you can accept you for who you are, you're on, you're on the right track of finding your why, your passion, your reason for being here. And going on to the future. So, you know, again, from the, the surveys and, you know, the, again, I know the statistics are very restricted or it, it's difficult to speak up about this, but the studies done on how there's splits of orientations in, in countries where there's high levels of honor killings. And I know it's probably a lot more muted than what's really the true amount, but there seems to be a lot of tie on, you know, the type of conservative environments that link to where, you know, there's a lack of sexual liberalization and, and the lack of equality. And that's really where the worrying thing is, it tends to be higher in the places where there isn't a trend towards a more liberal view of you know the younger age groups which means it doesn't really show signs of evolving especially in that parts of the, those parts of the world so what are you you know what are you focusing on now what's your main goals i'm involved with a lot of different non-profits i've got my own non-profit called endonakillings.org which will be registered hopefully by the end of this year it takes time um, but i'm involved with a lot of non-profits one is based in switzerland it's to do with human trafficking um, I'm involved with a couple in Africa, a couple in Africa in Zimbabwe and Nigeria because of child brides, because girls get married from the age of 12 if they don't stay in education there. And um, my main purpose is to try and raise awareness, but also to re-educate people. If we can keep a girl in education to the age of 16, she tends to get a different kind of job where she can then break the cycle and come back and help another girl stay in education and it's funding at the end of the day but it's also about parental mindsets which we're trying to change and it's not going to happen overnight laws are not going to get changed a lot of these political laws that are created are in conjunction with religious schools and religious boarding schools and sex because they're very intertwined with the human trafficking thing and um, where my sister, incidentally, was left by my father, my half-sister, he took her over there to India, the foothills of um, the Himalayas. He took her there and left her there because he'd had an affair with a Polish lady and to hide his secret, he'd abducted her without the mother's knowledge. And he, I thought he'd taken her to kill her in an honour killing. And it was only with my work with human trafficking that I learned the place he left her was actually a place where he would have sold her to traffickers. Um, and those traf that particular trafficking area is mainly to do with um, harvesting organs. So they take young children and they kill them and they use their organs and sell them, which is a massive, massive market in India itself. Um, so going on from that, what I'm trying to do is create some sort of change. And if I say to you, this is what happened to me, you'll go on to somebody else and say, actually, I was talking to Nina, I heard this podcast she was talking and she was saying, this is what's happened to her. And that other person may be working the police. They may be working as a social services representative or a teacher in a school. And they can then look out to help that person enable them to save a life. And ultimately, I know together, collectively, we are a strong force and we can create change. You know, Nina today is a best-selling author. It's a self-help book I wrote. All the proceeds go to a non-profit. I'm a a coach, a mindset performance coach for UFC fighters, MMA fighters, boxers, and a lot of um, people that are really doing well in sports. And people say, why are you? You know, How do you know these people? And I say, well, I don't go out looking for them. And they say, well, how can I attract famous people? I want to mm. famous people. And I say, well, actually, they come to me. 
I don't actually go looking for them. And it's your energy. Yeah. Your energy speaks before you do. People can spot somebody that's authentic. And like you said at the beginning, everyone's a life coach. You speak to anyone, everyone's a life coach. Because they, they come from a good place. They've done courses. But genuinely, can they give the right advice? Can they help? I don't know. Um, but the people that need you will find you. I know that much. I was I was thinking, why are all these men coming towards me? And I, I want to find these girls that I want to help. But the girls will find me, and they are finding me. The men also that need help are finding me. And as I said, MMA, you get knocked down over and over again, UFC, boxes. And I know what it feels like to have that mindset of when every bone is broken in your body, it's the mind. And it was my mindset that said to me, get up. And I crawled away. That's how I escaped. So the mind is such a huge, powerful muscle that we probably don't realize the strength it has. And what would be the best way for someone who wants to reach out to you, whether it is for, you know, what you can offer in terms of this mindset coaching, or they just, you know, would people be all right to reach out to you who want to know more about your story or just someone to confide in? It's definitely. I mean, I, I'm i always available to anyone who's got a problem. You know, if I don't get back to you, I will get back to you at some point. Um, I care about everyone. So if anyone's out there really struggling, you can look at my videos. A lot of people find my videos quite motivational in the sense they, they watch them and they get a message that sometimes resonates with them. But you just have to go to my website, which is my name dot com. And you know what, if you are struggling, just just know it's okay to struggle. It's hard to ask for help, but you matter and you are loved. And and you know, I want you to understand that it matters to me. To me it really matters. So reach out reach out if you need me thank you thank you for being so raw open and honest and you know again like i say we didn't even get through a huge chunk of your story but um again i know you know you've you've spoken about it previously um you've t- spoken about it on previous podcasts and on tedx and these are all available for people to listen to i've heard it and this is what made me so grateful that you made the time to to come here and talk to me and you know link it all to this um this this broader concept of culture and you know this multi-general multi-generational podcast of how these influences pass on which leads nicely onto how we like to close off our episodes where the previous guest would have two questions so question one is given the you know the influences and the roles that your previous uh, generations have played on you know how they've shaped you um what teachings do you really want to be able to pass on to your children and their future generations so i love my culture i'm not as um feminist i want to make that very clear i've passed on to my children to take any part of anybody else's culture and make it their own and create their own kind of way of living um, we live a very simple life. I don't believe in showing off to people. I'm very humble. Um, but also I take pride and I taught them to take pride in who they are because we shouldn't save our best clothes for weddings or festivals or wherever it is. We should always treat ourselves in a way where we feel good every day. And that's what I've I've taught them to feel good about themselves, to acknowledge that we can't always be okay as well. You know, we're not always okay. It's all right not to be okay. Yeah. Um. And I, I, I hope, hopefully, I've encouraged them to look after other people because it means a lot to me. And they are very caring towards others. They will go out of their way and help somebody rather than waiting for someone else to do it. Because a lot of us will see something that's going on in the world and know it's wrong, but we won't do anything. And that makes us part of the problem, not the solution. And that's what I've passed down to them to always be part of the the solution as opposed to the problem. I like that. And finally, what unpopular opinion do you think you have? So what what is something that you believe you really believe in that you think maybe the majority of other people might not? I believe that we're all superhumans, I do, and I believe life is a game. Okay. I believe this game has been created by the creator for us. And if we play by the rules which are written in every religious um book um, whatever you want to call it script if we play by those rules and we are good people and we are honest from our hearts and we love from our hearts that we will get to the top of this game and once we are set free is actually when we die i think we're all dead now and when we die we are alive and our spirits are then able to 
go from different places freely 